Chapter Ten of *The Girl from Farris's by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Chapter Ten: Rats Desert. For a long month, Ogden Secor lay at St. Luke's. Surgeons pulled their whiskers, glaring owl-like at the patient. The while they wondered why the deuce nature had not come to their rescue. At last, she did, to some measure at least, and he was bundled off home, weak and broken. They advised him to seek change and rest in a long ocean voyage, but he felt that his business, already long neglected, needed him. Not that he longer found the old keen delight and anticipation of strenuous copying with the storms and buffeting of the commercial world, but rather that habit drove him to it. He found conditions in a frightful muddle. No one seemed to know what had been transpiring in the office, Stickler least of all. Secor did not deem it necessary to question Sammy. It had been better for him had he done so. One of his first inquiries was for Miss Lethrop. Mr. Stickler looked at him in surprise. "'Why, I discharged her, Mr. Secor,' he said. "'You certainly cannot mean that you would have cared to continue her in our employ after learning the reputation she bore.' "'Reputation?' repeated Secor. "'I do not quite grasp you, Mr. Stickler.' Mr. Stickler explained. It soon became evident to him that there was something radically wrong with his employer. There was a blank look of utter incomprehension upon Ogden Secor's face. "'It is odd,' he said at last, "'that I do not recall any of the incidences which you relate.' You are quite sure, Stickler? Quite sure, sir. As day succeeded day, Ogden Secor realized more and more fully what an unusual secretary Miss Lathrop had been. He no longer mentioned her to Mr. Stickler, but he missed her very much just the same. At times he recalled with a start the things that Stickler had told him about the girl's past, and then he would realize that after all it would have been impossible to have retained her. It was too bad, he thought. Too bad. Such secretaries as she were scarce. As to Stickler's assertion that she had connived with the cracksmen, furnishing them with the combination to the safe, Secor would not believe it. Months rolled by, September came again. Long since, Mr. Stickler had realized that his chief's memory was far from what it had been prior to the injuries he had received at the hands of the burglars. Ogden Secor, too, had guessed at something of the sort. He seemed to have lost his grasp. His usually alert mind was no longer equal to the emergencies that were constantly arising in his business. Not only did he find it more and more difficult to close contracts, but those that he did obtain netted him losses now instead of profits of the past. There was a leak somewhere, but Ogden Secor was not mentally fit to discover it. Matters went from bad to worse. His losses on the year's work entailed the necessity of mortgaging the bulk of his real estate holdings to complete the large public works contract in the neighboring city. Unable longer to concentrate his mind upon the work in hand, it ran completely away with him. Stickler assumed more and more the direction of it. High prices were paid for inferior materials and for large amounts that were never delivered. Where the difference went, the books of the corporation did not show, and if they had, it is doubtful if Ogden Secor's waning mentality would have been able to understand that he was being persistently and systematically betrayed and robbed. The final blow came when the engineers of the city for which the work was being done refused to accept it on the grounds that scarcely any of the material used was up to specifications. Coincidentally, Mr. Strickler resigned his position with John Secor & Co., to accept the management of a stronger competitor. An expensive lawsuit followed the refusal of the municipality, for which the work had been done, to pay the bill. In the end, Secor lost. Bankruptcy proceedings followed, and on the first of the following February, Ogden Secor found himself a ruined man, almost penniless, and broken as well in health and mentality. With the exception of a worthless and barren farm in Idaho and a few articles of clothing, he had disposed of everything he possessed in an endeavor to meet the demands of his creditors. The farm, too, would have gone with the rest had he recalled the existence of it. During the past few months of mental and nervous stress, Secor had seen but little of Sophia Wells. He had not felt equal to the rounds of social activity which constituted her life, nor had he found her generously sympathetic. Now that the end had come, he had sought her, hoping against hope that the ubiquitous Mr. Person would not be present. To his relief, he found Sophia Wells alone. She did not need the evidence of his tired and haggard face to realize the demand that might presently be made upon her sympathy and generosity. She had but just laid aside the noon edition of an afternoon paper in which she had perused the last of the rapidly dwindling references to a failure that had at first occupied a large part of the front pages of many editions. Sophia Wells knew at last that Ogden Secor was a hopelessly ruined man. There was but one thing to do. She must forestall him. "'I am glad you have come here today, Ogden,' she said with a brief exchange of greetings. "'For almost a year now I have had a great load weighing heavily upon my shoulders.' Miss Wells did not say upon her heart and I am only sorry that I did not speak of it long ago, for I can only too well realize the motives that may now be unjustly attributed to me in pressing the subject at this time of temporary financial trouble in which you find yourself. To be quite frank, 
I discovered long since that my affections were surely directing themselves toward another. I should have told you at once, but I was not sure at first, and I dreaded causing you useless pain. She paused. Secor looked at her through dull eyes. It was evident that he was going to take it much harder than she had supposed. It is true that not once, since his accident, had he spoken to her of their engagement. There had been much in the way of sentimental exchanges between them, so that the absence of these had aroused little or no surprise in the girl's mind. She was glad now that it had been so, for it was going to make a difficult job much less difficult than it would otherwise have been. Yet it was going to be hard enough. She could see that. She wondered why he didn't say something. Finally, he coughed, a slight flush mounting his pale face. I am quite sure, Sophia, he said, that I shall always be most satisfied with what brings you the greatest happiness. She noted the puzzled expression on his face, attributing it to a natural desire to learn who had supplanted him in her affections. I feel, she explained, that we are not exactly suited to one another. Our ideals are not the same. You do not find interest in what interests me most, and so it seemed to me, as there may never be any deep-rooted common interest between us, that we should soon be most unhappy together. The puzzled expression seemed to have been growing upon the handsome face of Mr. Ogden Secor. Yes, he breathed. I fear that you are right. Mr. Person, on the contrary, went on Miss Wells, feels precisely as I do upon the subjects that are closest to my heart. They are the same that are closest to his. In fact, Ogden, I'm going to ask you to release me from my engagement to you. Involuntarily, Ogden Secor's mouth opened, but whether in surprise or because of a terrible shock to his love and pride, it would have been difficult to say. Miss Wells attributed it to the latter. At last, he found words. My dear Sophia, he said, you know perfectly well that if you love Mr. Person, I shall be the last person on earth to stand in the way of your realizing to the full every happiness that may be found at his disposal. I congratulate you, Sophia, sincerely, and I beg that you will give no further thought of me other than as a friend and a well-wisher. You are very generous, Ogden, she said, and she bade him good-bye, glad that the ordeal was so easily over. It would have been a much surprise Miss Wells could that young lady have read Ogden Secor's thoughts as he ran down the broad steps before her home and made his way to the nearest elevated station. And to think, thought he, that for over a year have been engaged to Sophia Wells without once recalling the fact. Those cracksmen most assuredly cracked something belonging to Ogden Secor beside his safe. It was with a feeling of relief and elation that he had not felt before for months that he strode along the street. Evidently, the obligation of his engagement had been weighing upon him heavily through the medium of his subconsciousness, without his having once objectively sensed, other than an inexplicable call to duty that had drawn him to Sophia Wells, when he gladly would have been elsewhere. As he walked toward the elevated, he tried to recall under what circumstances he had become engaged to Miss Wells. As he viewed the matter now, it was difficult to realize that any possible contingency could have arisen that would have caused him to look with tender affection upon the cold and calculating Sophia. The loss of his fortune affected Ogden Secor less than might have been expected. Possibly he did not fully realize the completeness of his financial ruin, or what it was bound to mean to him. In a way, he felt principally a certain relief from the galling pressure and annoyances of the past bitter year. No longer was he weighed with burdensome responsibilities and grave apprehensions. The worst had happened. There was no further calamity possible, at least so he thought. Vaguely, he felt that he could build up a fortune equal to that which was gone, but there was none of the old-time assurance and determination that had marked him in the past. It seemed quite impossible for him to concentrate his mind for a sufficient length of time upon the subject to formulate even the foundation of a well-considered plan. He sought out old friends upon whose business acumen he might rely with the intention of talking over his plans with them, for at last, and the first time in his life, Ogden Secor felt unequal to the task of reasoning for himself, much less deciding in any matter of importance. The first man to whom he went was the president of the bank of which Secor was still a director, and with which he had transacted the bulk of his banking business. The president was an old personal friend, a man of about Secor's own age, a member of the same clubs and the same set. Heretofore he had been wont to drop whatever had been engaging him and come into the anteroom to greet Secor whenever he had a chance to call. Today the caller waited thirty minutes before the bank president appeared. Well, Secor, he said, what can I do for you? Heretofore it had always been Ogden. There was an unquestionable air of haste in his manner, too, nor did he take Mr. Secor familiarly by the arm and drag him into his luxurious private office as formerly. It was just, well, Secor, what can I do for you? Those who are congenitally inefficient are prone to sensitiveness, and the same is often true of men who, through illness or preposterous circumstance, find themselves temporarily unfit to cope with the stern demands of modern success-building. Supersensitiveness often begets a preternatural and almost uncanny ability to sense the secret motives underlying the acts of others. Ogden Secor had never been oversensitive. Until now he had not appreciated the fact that there could possibly be any material difference in the Ogden Secor of yesterday and the Ogden Secor of today. He had never gauged men by their bank accounts, 
so it is not strange that he should have been unsuspecting that any might have gauged him by such a standard. The words and manner of the bank president, however, awoke him violently and painfully. For Ogden Secor was now, whatever he might have been in the past, an inefficient and accordingly a supersensitive. There is nothing you can do for me, Norton, he said. I just dropped in for a chat. You're busy, though, and I won't detain you. He turned to go. I am mighty busy today, replied the bank president, a trifle more cordially. Come in again sometime, won't you? Thanks, replied Secor. When he reached the street, he found himself cold all over, cold with a heart coldness with which the bleak February northeaster had nothing to do. He did not venture to call upon another friend. Instead, he dropped into a bar on La Salle Street and took a stiff drink of whiskey. It was the first time he had done that for a longer time than he could recall. The drink warmed him, sending an intoxicating, if artificial, renewal of hope and confidence surging through him. He took another. There was a genial stranger drinking alone at the same bar. He commented upon the severity of the storm. Ogden Secor, friends with all the world now, entered into conversation with him. "'Wish I was back in Idaho,' remarked the stranger, "'where I can get thought out and see that the sun was doing business at the same old stand. Idaho! It awakened something in Secor's memory.' "'I thought that it was usually pretty cold there,' he said. "'Not where I come from,' replied the stranger. "'I got a little fruit ranch down in the southwestern corner of the state. Greatest little climate in the world, sir. Never gets anywhere as near zero. And sunshine! Why, man, you ain't got a bowing acquaintance with old soul back here. Three hundred and sixty days of sunshine out of every three hundred and sixty-five. Secord smiled. You remind me of the boosters of sunny Southern California, he laughed. Don't, said the Idahoan, raising a deprecating hand. What I'm telling you is the truth. What part of Idaho did you say you're from? asked Secor. About ten miles south of Goliath. Goliath's a division headquarters of the short line. Goliath, repeated Secor. Why, I've got a ranch around there somewheres myself. Took it on a trade years ago and forgot all about it. A hundred and sixty acres, I think it was. Sort of funny for a man to forget a hundred and sixty acre ranch, remarked the stranger a bit skeptically. During the following week, Ogden Secor drank a great deal more than was good for him, or for any man. Several times he met old acquaintances on the streets, ever eager now to discover changes in the attitude of former friends. He was quick to note the seeming coldness of their greetings, and the remarkable stress of unprecedented business which invariably hurried them along. After each encounter he sought the nearest bar. His mind was much occupied with thoughts of his forgotten ranch, and when a summons to his attorney's office revealed the fact that the final settlement with the creditors would leave him with several hundred dollars of unexpected wealth, he obtained an advance from them, purchased the ticket for Goliath, Idaho, and shook the grimy snow of the loop from his feet, he hoped, forever. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of the Girl from Farris's by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Chapter Eleven: A Matter of Memory. From La Salle Street to Goliath, Idaho, is ordinarily a matter of some two days' travel, but it required the best part of a year for Ogden Secor to perform the journey. On the train, he became acquainted with an alert and plausible stranger who owned a gold mine in the mountains north of Ketchum. All that was needed for development was a few hundred dollars worth of machinery and flumes that would make its owners fabulously wealthy. By the time the train reached Shoshone, Ogden Secor was inoculated with the insidious virus of gold fever, that mad malady which raises white hot through the veins of its victims, distorting every mental image and precluding the sane functioning of the powers of reason. In possession of all of his faculties at their best, Secor could never have been trapped so easily, but what with weakened mental and physical powers, the result primarily of the work of the cracksmen, and later of the effects of alcohol. He fell an easy prey to the highly imaginative enthusiasm of his new acquaintance. And so it befell that he left the train at Shoshone, and in company with the owner of the gold mine, boarded another for Ketchum, the northern terminus of the branch line. Ketchum is, or at that time was, a squalid wreck of a place. But, like every other settlement of its stamp, it boasted several saloons. To one of these the mine owner led his victim. Here they discussed ways, means, and barbed wire whiskey until Secor passed over the few hundred dollars remaining to him that his partner might go forth and purchase the necessary machinery and the outfit that was to transport it and them north into the mountains of the Marrow. Secor, waiting, drank with the proprietor, with the loungers around the place, and with others who drifted in scenting whiskey at another's expense. Night came and still the mine owner had not returned, nor did he ever. Next morning Secor awoke, partially sobered, to a realization of the truth. He had been fleeced. He was friendless and all but penniless in a strange town, but worst of all, his nerve was gone. The year that followed was a hideous nightmare of regret and shame, the sole surcease from which was obtainable only through the stupefying medium of drink. Oftentimes he was hungry, 
for there was little chance to earn money in Ketchum. Again, he did odd jobs about one or the other of the several saloons when a flash of his waning self-pride or the growing desire for whiskey goaded him to the earning of money. Later he was given work as a clerk in the general store, his knowledge of accounting proving of value to the proprietor. This man, realizing that the continuous use of whiskey would have no tendency to increase the value of his new clerk, employed him with the understanding that for six months he was to have but a small percentage of his wages weekly, just enough after the store closed Saturday night to permit a mild orgy from which one might recover over Sunday and be fit to work for Monday. At the termination of six months, Secor demanded the balance of his accrued wage and received it. Much to his employer's surprise, he failed to spend it immediately for drink. Instead, he did what he had been planning upon, took the first train south for Shoshone and Goliath. In his mind was a determination to seek his farm and be thereafter independent of any employer. There was, too, the decision to stop drinking, but little did the man realize the hold the sickness had taken upon him. Secor found Goliath a thriving town of three or four thousand inhabitants. His first inquiry, notwithstanding his good resolutions, was for a saloon, nor did he have any difficulty in locating several. The tiresome journey from Ketchum had given him far too much leisure with his own gloomy thoughts and vain regrets for company. A little drink would do no harm, and then he would stop. He would never touch it again, but just now his nerves required the stimulant. Then, too, was it not a well-known fact that in too sudden a cessation of the habit lay grave danger? Ah, criminal fallacy! To you how many countless thousand graves owe their poor, miserable inmates! And so it happened that at dusk it was a far from sober man who entered the palace lunchroom in time for the evening meal. As he slouched down upon his stool, his befogged vision struggling with the blurred and scrawly purple of the mimeographed bill of fare, the girl waiting across the counter from him for his order could scarce conceal the disgust she felt at this slovenly and unkempt appearance. She could not see his face while his head was bent low above the greasy card, but she knew that it must be equally as repulsive as his soiled and disheveled apparel. Who would have guessed that this object of the content of a cheap lunch counter waitress in a far western railroad town could have been the spotless Ogden Secor of two brief years ago? Presently he looked up into the girl's face. At sight of his features she gave a little involuntary gasp, stepping back at the same time as though to avoid a blow. Smatter, asked Mr. Secor. The girl eyed him intently for a moment, and then with a sigh of relief forced a smile to her white lips. He had not recognized her. Nothing, she said. I'm taken that way occasionally. Heart, asked Mr. Secor. June Lethrop looked at Mr. Ogden Secor in silence for a moment. "'I wonder,' she said half to herself, "'I wonder if it is he.' He gave his order and ate in silence, occasionally casting a furtive glance in the girl's direction. When she brought his dessert, he asked where he might find a comfortable hotel. "'I only just arrived,' he explained, "'and I'm not familiar with the town.' The meal had sobered him a bit, so that he could talk a trifle more coherently. As he ate his pie, June stood in front of him, talking. She told him where there was a room in a private family nearby that he could probably get. He was filled with wonder at the change that had taken place in him. When his face was in response, the depth of sorrow that it revealed touched her heart. In vain she looked for the one-time radiant smile that endeared Ogden Secor to many beside herself. Could it be possible that this was the fastidious society and businessman she had known but little more than two years since? It was incredible. Are you going to remain here? she asked. I guess so, he replied. I have a ranch around here somewhere. I've never seen it, but I'm going out tomorrow to have a look at it. And if it's all right, I'll settle here and go to ranching. Much doing in that line? Alfalfa and fruit ranches pay fairly well, she replied. It depends, of course, on several things. Soil, water rights, and, she hesitated, the man who's ranching. Farming, nowadays, you know, is something of an exact science. To be a successful man, you must understand that haphazard methods won't work. Can a man learn, he asked? Yes, she replied, but even then he won't succeed if— She hated to say it, but, oh, how she hated to see him as he was. But even then he won't succeed if he drinks. Ogden Secor flushed. He was still far from having lost all self-respect. Without another word, he paid his check and walked out of the lunchroom. It served him right, he thought, for having entered into familiar conversation with a waitress. The following morning he engaged a buckboard and a driver for the trip to his ranch. A half-hour's hunt through the records of the county clerk's office sufficed to locate his tract. As he was driving through town, he told his guide to stop in front of a saloon. We may get dry before the day's over, he explained with a grin to the more than willing native. It would never do to stop too suddenly. As he stepped up to the bar and ordered a flask, the words of the waitress came suddenly to his mind. But even then he won't succeed if he drinks. They seemed to take the edge off his appetite for whiskey, but he pocketed the bottle and soon was jogging along through the stifling dust toward the only thing on earth that he might by any twist of the imagination call home. As they drove along, Secor tried to picture the rolling meadow lands, the shady orchards, the broad green fields of wheel-high, scent-sweeted alfalfa of his ranch. Never before had he given this least valued of his possessions more than a passing thought. 
but now that it seemed to offer him a peaceful haven of rest and quiet and utter seclusion from the world that he had known and come to hate he viewed it through a mind's eye that glorified and idealized he could scarce restrain his impatience with the slow plodding team that wallowed now through sand to their fetlocks and again labored upward towards the brow of a rough lava-strewn bluff at last they came within sight of a broad willow-fringed river low islands dense thicketed clove the strong swift current with their sharp points they might have been great flat ships forging their silent way toward the distant mountains of the northland and whence the mighty river tumbled roaring downward for its thousand-mile journey to the water of the lesser stream that steals its identity onward to the sea all was grayish green or greenish brown and all was sere and desolate and cold here and there little patches of half-melted snow lay in the shadows of the sagebrush that dotted the rolling flat beside the river beyond secor could see a similar landscape upon the other shore it is farther than i thought he said to the guide that's mostly the way in idaho replied the man secor was wondering how they were to cross that mighty torrent for it was evident that the ranch must be beyond the river there was no signs of habitation no rolling meadowlands no shady orchards no green alfalfa fields with its can upon the river's heather side he realized of course that the season precluded the full summation of his dream but there would at least be plenty to suggest the beauties of the spring and summer when they should come upon his home the guide drew rein upon a little knoll beside the river want to get out he asked what for questioned secor we're here secor looked at him searchingly already the truth was leering at him with a contemptuous grin is this it he asked nodding his head in a half swing that took in the surrounding desert yep said the guide tain't much good you ain't got no water secord laughed a merry mirthless laugh oh he said i think it's a pretty good place what for asked the guide in surprise to take a drink said secord pulling the flask from his overcoat pocket the guide grinned and you don't need no water for that he said no replied secord water'd spoil it for weeks secord frequented the q p saloon at goliath emerging occasionally to eat and sleep every time he ate he was reminded of the waitress at the palace lunchroom but he didn't go there he wondered when his mind was not entirely befogged by drink why the girl should cling so tenaciously to his memory and what cause there could be for the uncomfortable feeling that accompanied recollection of her warning for warning it evidently had been one night secor was sitting in the stud poker game the gentleman next to him developed the crouching manner of inspecting his buried card placing his eye on a level with the table and barely raising the corner of his own card this permitted him to inspect secor's buried card at the same time a dozen hands were dealt before secor discovered why he always won small pots and lost the larger ones then he saw that his worthy opponent not only looked at secor's buried card but immediately thereafter passed obvious signals across the table to a crony upon the other side at the following deal secor did not look at his buried card at all he merely remained in on the strength of what he had in sight from the corner of his eye he saw that the sly one was becoming nervous secor had an ace and two deuces up but there was still one card to be dealt at the betting secor raised for the first time then proposedly he turned his head away from his cards and the man at his left to take a drink that stood in his right hand he guessed what would happen when the drink was halfway to his lips he turned suddenly to the left to discover the sly one in the act of raising his secor's buried card to learn its identity like a flash secor wheeled dashing his glass with its contents full in the face of the cheater with the same move he gained to his feet the other whipped a revolver from beneath his coat the balance of the players scattered and the loungers in the saloon ran for the doorway or dived over the bar for the security its panels seemed to offer if secor had been a foot further away from his antagonist he would doubtless have been killed as it was his very proximity saved him there is no easier weapon to parry at close range than a firearm the slightest deviation of aim renders it harmless as the gun flashed beneath the electric light secor's left arm went up to parry it as if it had been a clenched right fist aimed at his jaw the bullet passed harmlessly past him and with a report of the exploding cartridge his own right landed heavily upon the point of the cheater's chin the man went backwards over his chair his head striking heavily upon the massive pottery spittoon then he lay perfectly still. Ogden Secor stood with wide eyes gazing at the prostrate form of his antagonist, dazed. The bartender poked his head above the sheltering breastwork of the bar. Seeing that the shooting appeared to be over, he emerged. His first act was to remove the gun from the nerveless fingers of the supine man. Then he turned toward Secor. Got a gun? he asked. Secor shook his head negatively. A moment later the players and the loungers returned to bend over the quiet form upon the floor. With them came the sheriff and a doctor. The former, after questioning the bartender, took Secor into custody, as several men carried the injured gambler into the back room. All night Ogden Secor sat sleepless in the bare cell. He was very sober now, and all the depths to which he had sunk were revealed to him in all their appalling horridness. It was unthinkable, and yet it was true. He, Ogden Secor, a participant in a drunken saloon brawl. Tomorrow, or as soon as they should release him, he would seek out the man he had struck and apologize to him, although he knew that the fellow deserved all he had gotten. 
He was sorry now that the bullet intended for him had not found him. It would have been better so, and infinitely easier than to go on living the worthless, besotted life that he was surely headed for. By eight o'clock in the morning the sheriff entered the corridor outside his cell. "'How's Thompson this morning?' asked Secor. Thompson was the name of the cheater. "'I guess he's comfortable,' said the officer with a grin. "'He ain't sent back for nothing.' "'Has he left town?' asked Secor. "'Yep,' said the sheriff. "'He's dead. You killed him.' Secor collapsed upon the hard bench at the side of his cell. He felt as though some mighty hand had struck him heavily over the heart. There was a look in his eyes that the sheriff had never seen in the eyes of another of the many killers he had arrested during his long years of service. It was neither fear nor horror. The sheriff could not have interpreted it, for he knew not what heights pride of name, of family, of station, birth, and breeding may lift a man above the sordid crimes, nor how awful is to plunge from such a pinnacle to the bottomless pit of shame which Ogden Secor's naked soul was plumbing that instant. You needn't take it hard, said the sheriff kindly. You hit him in self-defense. There's half a dozen witnesses to the fact, and to the fact that you wasn't armed. It was hitting the spittoon with the back of his head that killed him. There ain't a jury in Idaho that find you guilty. You ought to have a medal for all the ornery cusses that ever struck Goliath. That tin horn was the most orneriest. After the sheriff left him, Ogden Secor sat with bowed head, his chin resting in his palms. He was surprised that the thought that he had killed a fellow man should not weigh more heavily upon him. It was the debauching derogation that had led him up to the killing that caused him the most suffering. The words of the waitress at the palace lunchroom came back to him once more. But even then, he won't succeed if he drinks. Well, he wasn't succeeding in anything except getting rid of his little store of money. What in the world was there for him to succeed at anyway, he thought. If the ranch had been any good, he would have pitched in there and worked hard. There he could have led a decent life and earned a respectable living. He had no ambition for anything greater but the sight of the arid sagebrush wilderness which had dispelled his dreams of fertile orchard, field, and meadow land had so discouraged him that, since, he had been able to see no brighter ray than that which is reflected from the liquid fire which crossed the bar of the QP in sparkling glasses. As he sat buried in vain regrets and sorrowful memories, weighed down by his thoughts of his utter friendlessness and loneliness, he became aware of the presence of someone approaching his cell along the short corridor. Not sufficiently interested even to look up, he sat with his eyes riveted upon the cold, gray cement of his prison floor. It was not until the footfalls halted before the bars of his cell that he raised his eyes. With a little start of surprise he came to his feet. Before him, smiling down into his face, stood the waitress of the palace lunchroom. He looked at her inquiringly. I thought, she said, that you might be lonesome here that there might be something I could do for you. If June Lethrop had required any reward for the generous impulse that had sent her to seek or side in the time of his adversity, she was amply repaid by the expression that lighted his face at her words. He almost choked as he attempted to reply. And I was just thinking, he said, how absolutely friendless I am here. It is awful good of you. I don't know how to thank you. But you really ought not to be here. I am not, not the sort of person a decent girl should know. To what awful depths of self-abasement must Ogden Secor have sunk to voice such a sentiment as this? June felt the tears coming to her eyes. You mustn't say that, she said. The sheriff told me all about it, and that you— It was in self-defense. It isn't that, said Secor. It's that I was there at all, gambling in a saloon, and drunk. Drunk! I should have thought that would have killed whatever natural sympathy a woman might feel for a man who had killed another, even in self-defense. And, he continued, do you remember the warning you gave me the first day that I was in Goliath? Yes, she said, but I didn't think that you would. I have, a hundred times, he said, and wondered why I should. I wondered, too, what prompted you. Did I seem as bad as that even then? Or what was it?" She did not dare tell him. He looked at her closely for a moment. "'Haven't I known you somewhere?' he asked. She mustered all her courage. It was less on her own account that she dreaded telling him than on his. To be befriended by her might seem the last straw, the final depth, below which there was no sinking. "'My name is Lathrop,' she said. "'June Lathrop.' Secor shook his head. "'No,' he said. "'I don't know you.' But there's something mighty familiar about your face. End of chapter eleven. Chapter twelve of *The Girl from Farris's by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Chapter twelve. Just three words. The coroner's jury exonerated Secor. He was never brought to trial. For two weeks he remained in jail, waiting for the action of the grand jury. That body returned in no bill, and Ogden Secor stepped once more into the world of freedom. During the period of his incarceration, June had visited him daily. She felt, in a measure, a certain sense of obligation. This man, by a smile and a pleasant word, had set her feet back into the path of rectitude at a time when hope was gone from her life. She could do no less than exert what small influence she might wield to lead him from the path toward which he had strayed. She was glad that he had not remembered her, or at least that he had pretended that he did not. 
she was not sure which was the true explanation of his non-recognition. As yet she had not guessed the serious nature of the results that had followed his slugging at the hands of the cracksman. Between the noon and evening meals June had a couple of hours to herself, and it was at this period that she visited Secor in his cell. He came to look forward eagerly to her coming, except for a few of the cupy hangers-on, she was his only visitor. It was June who had brought him word of the grand jury's action. The kindly sheriff, meeting her at the jail's door, as he himself was bearing the news to the prisoner, told her that Secor was a free man, that she might carry the cheering message to him. I reckon he'd rather hear from them pretty lips anyway, he added, winking knowingly. June flushed. It had never occurred to her that any one might find foundation for imagining the existence of tender sentiments between herself and Ogden Secor in her daily visits to the prisoner. So it was with an emotion akin to diffidence that she approached the cell that day. Secor received the news of his final exoneration without any show of elation. June looked at him in surprise. "'Doesn't it make you happy?' she exclaimed. "'Why, I wanted to throw up my hat and shout when the sheriff told me.' He shook his head. "'Why should it make me happy?' he asked. "'What am I coming out to? Who cares whether I'm in or out?' And then, at the hurt look which she could not hide, he exclaimed regretfully, "'Oh, I didn't mean that exactly. I know that you care, and it means everything to me to know that there is one good, kind heart in the world. But, Miss Lathrop, your generosity would go out the same to a yellow dog, but not your respect. You can't help being kind and sweet, for your soul is pure and true. I can read it in your eyes, but even that can't blind you to the bald and brutal fact of what I am, a drunken bum.' The bitterness of his tone turned the girl cold. "'And what am I coming out to?' he went on. "'I'm coming out to the QP. That'll be the first place I head for. There's no other place I may go, and tonight I'll be drunk again.' She stretched her hands between the iron bars and laid her slim fingers on the man's arm. Her eyes were dim with tears, and she raised them to his. "'Oh, don't,' she pleaded. "'Please don't. You mustn't throw your life away. Remember who you are, what you have been, what you may be again. Oh, won't you promise me that you'll never touch it again?' The tear-filled eyes, the pleading voice— the touch upon his arm sent a sudden thrill through every fiber of Ogden Secor's being. Never before had he realized half the beauties of the girl's face and soul as revealed that instant as she pleaded with him for his own honor. He forgot that he was Ogden Secor, that she was a waitress in a cheap lunchroom. Slowly his hand crept up until his fingers closed upon hers. He leaned forward close to the intervening bars. There was a light in his eyes that had never shown upon Sophia Wells. June, he whispered, his voice now husky with emotion. I can stop. I can do anything for your sake. June, I. Like a flash, the girl snatched her hand from his. Her fingers flew across her lips as though to smother the word that he had spoken. It seemed almost like a blow. No, she fairly shouted. Oh, God, you don't know what you're saying. Don't say it. Don't think it. It was too awful. And pressing her clenched hands to her face, she turned and almost ran from the jail. For a moment, Secor stood as though stunned. He had seen the horror mirrored in the girl's eyes, and he placed the only interpretation upon it that he could. God, he muttered as he sank to his hard bench, have I sunk so low as that? A few minutes later he was released from jail. He did not hesitate. With long, eager strides he made straight for the QP. For a month he scarce drew a sober breath. Then he landed in jail again, this time as a plain drunk. He had been picked up from the gutter by a town policeman. June heard of it and came to his cell early the next morning. He met her look almost defiantly, but at the pain and sorrow in her face his eyes wavered and fell. "'I shouldn't think you want to sully your name by coming to see the town drunkard,' he said, and then bitterly, "'I'd have stopped for your sake even without your love.' I don't blame you for that, but you needn't have been so disgusted by the thought that I loved you. You didn't think that, she exclaimed. What else could I think? I read it in your expression. Oh, it wasn't that, she cried. You must know that I couldn't come to see you or want so to help you if I felt that way. Then what is the reason? Why can't I tell you that I love you, June? he insisted. Tell me. I can't, she said, and you mustn't ask me to tell you. She was close to the bars now, and again she laid her hands upon his. I would do anything on earth for you, Ogden, she said except let you love me. Why can't you let me help you to win back the biggest thing you have lost, your self-respect? The rest will be easy then, and when you have it all once more, you'll want to go down on your knees and thank June Lethrop that she wouldn't let you fall in love with a, a waitress. Would it make you any happier, he asked? It would make me happier than I have ever expected I could be again. I'll try, he said, for your sake, but how am I to begin? What is there for me to do? Your ranch, she returned promptly. You told me you had a ranch down near the river. Secor laughed. I went to see it when I first came out. It's nothing but an unfenced sagebush desert. No water, no fences, no house, nothing. There's the river, she urged. But what can I do with the river? With a shovel and a pan you can get a living wage out of the gravel anywhere along the river, she answered. And you can live clean and decent. You're making nothing here, and you're living like a hog. Ogden Secor flushed. The words stung him. 
and because they stung, they did more to crystallize the good intentions that the girl's pleas had aroused than with further pleading, for they awoke with him the fast-dying flame of his self-respect. "'I'll do it, June,' he said, "'for your sake, but give me something to hope for, if I succeed. Tell me that you may then listen to what you won't listen to now. When you are back where you should be,' she said, "'I mean physically, morally, and mentally, you won't care to have a waitress here you tell that you love her. I'm not in love with a waitress, June. I've dared aspire to an angel.' The police magistrate before whom Secor was arraigned had acquired local celebrity through the success he had made of keeping Goliath fairly free of bums and hobos. The sheriff and the constabulary worked with him. They arrested every undesirable stranger upon the streets, and the judge forthwith put them back upon the streets, padlocked to a long chain. There they worked out their sentences until, released, they shook the dust of Goliath from their feet, nor ever thereafter ventured within her limits. To this good judge Mr. Ogden Secor looked like any other drunken bum that was hauled before him. There was, it is true, that about the cut of his disheveled clothes which proclaimed a one-time smartness. But this rather militated against the defendant, for in it the judge saw more sinister signs than mere worthlessness. Eastern crooks, he knew, were oft-times smartly clothed, or the man might have stolen the apparel, which was more likely. Three days in the chain gang, said the judge. Call the next case. Before those three awful days were over, Ogden Secor was more thoroughly sober than he had ever been in all his life, even in the days that he did not drink. He worked with eyes bent upon the ground, never once raising them. Through his mind ran four words, the words of hope and encouragement that June Lothrop had spoken. There's the river. But now it was a grim and sinister interpretation that he put upon them. There's the river. He could scarce wait for the knocking of his galling fetters from his ankles. There's the river. Yes, and there, too, lay forgetfulness of the hideous humiliation of these frightful days. June Lothrop saw him in the chain gang, as the motley crew worked upon the streets of Goliath. She turned her head away, lest he should see that she had seen, and hurried to her room, threw herself face down upon her bed, sobbing. Her tears were for him, for the hideous laceration of his pride she could read in the bent head and stooping shoulders. He had looked like an old man, tottering to his grave beneath a hopeless load of shame. God, how he had hurt her! Yet by all the age-old traits that were ascribed to humanity, she, of all others in the world, should have found sinister rejoicing in the suffering of this man. But instead there came to her for the first time a realization of the one thing above all others that might make her life even more miserable than it had been. She loved Ogden Secor. She knew now that she had always loved him, since that day that he had met her in the antechamber of the grand jury room. She saw now why she had set herself to the task of reclaiming him. She saw, too, why she had experienced such horror at the thought of voicing words of love to her. It was because she had loved him, and because in all the world of men and women he and she had the least right to love one another. When Secor's time in the chain gang was up, June was waiting for him outside the jail. Love had given her the power to read in the humiliation of the man she loved something of the stern resolve that had found lodgment in his mind. Intuitively, she sensed that would be the first impulse of a proud man, weakened by dissipation and bowed down by humiliation. She had been a down and outer herself. She had been on the verge of the very thing she had guessed Secor to be contemplating. It had come after that terrible morning at St. Luke's, but the memory of Ogden Secor's kindness to her had stayed her hand now she would repay him. With head still bowed and eyes upon the ground, he emerged from the jail. When June fell in beside him, he did not look up, though he knew that it was she. Who else was there in all the world that would be seen upon the public streets with him? In silence they walked side by side through the little city, down a dusty road toward the cool shadows of the tree-lined brook that winds along the pleasant valley. Secor moved but with one thought in his mind, to get beyond the sight of his fellow men. They came at last to the brim of the little stream. There were no prying eyes about them. June touched his hands gently where it hung at his side, and then her cool fingers closed upon his. Ogden, she whispered. He turned dull eyes upon her, as though for the first time realizing her presence. What are you doing here, he asked, and then, without waiting for her reply, went on. And you walked at my side through the streets, through the hideous streets where I worked with a chain upon my ankle, fastened to vagabonds and criminals, and to, to bums, to other bums like myself, drunken bums. Everyone must have seen you. Oh, June, how could you have done it? His thoughts now were all for her. There could have been nothing better for his sick brain, nauseated with continual thinking of his own shame. I must have been mad to let you do it, he went on. Your friends will jeer at you. They will link your name with that of Ogden Secor, the town drunkard. She clapped her hands over his lips. You mustn't say that, she cried. I won't let you say it. You're not that. You never could be that. You are making a mountain out of a molehill. It is not the man who falls who receives the censure of his fellows. It is the man who falls and won't get up, who lies wallowing in the filth of his degradation. The world admires the man who can come back. It hates a quitter. You have told me that you love me. She was speaking rapidly as though everything in the world hinged upon the element of time. You have asked me to love you. Do you expect me to love a quitter? 
You are thinking this minute of adding the final ignominy to your downfall. You are thinking this minute, Ogden Secor, of taking your own life. If I could love a quitter, do you think I can love a coward? Beneath the lash of her words, the man within him awakened. His shoulders straightened a bit. He looked her straight in the eyes for the first time that day. He was trying to fathom her interest in him. Presently he seemed to awaken. A sudden light dawned upon him. Hope lightened the lines of his tired and haggard face. Not for months had he looked so much like the Ogden Secor of the past. He took the girl by the shoulders. June, he cried, I've been trying to guess why you should have done all for me that you have done. There can be but one reason. You cannot deny it. Let me hear your lips speak what your acts have proclaimed. Tell me that you love me, June, and I can win back to any heights. She pushed him gently from her. Her heart ached to be pressed close in the arms of the man she loved. Yet she knew that it would never be. If her love would save him, she had no right to deny it, though she knew that such an avowal could bring nothing but misery and shame to them both. There never could be any consummation of a love between Ogden Secor and June Lathrop. I could not deny it now, she said at last, and if it will help you any to hear me say the thing I have no right to say, and that you have no right to hear, I can do it for your sake. But beyond the saying of it, Ogden, there could be nothing. That we must both understand. Why, I cannot tell you. I dare not. Do not ask me. It will be enough for now, he said, to hear you say it. Afterwards we shall find a way. Love always does, you know. And so she said the thing he wished to hear nor never in all his life had words sounded sweeter to Ogden Secor than those three from the lips of the words of the waitress from the palace lunchroom. End of chapter 12for a year, Ogden Secor toiled at his lonely camp beside the big river. His shovel and his pan and his crude rocker were his only companions. With the little money that had remained to him after his wasted days in Goliath, he had purchased material and tools for the construction of a frail shack on his land close to his place or diggings, and had furnished it with such bare necessities as he could afford. Once a week he walked the ten miles that lay between his camp and Goliath for a few hours with June Lanthrop. These were red-letter days for them both the sole bright spots in their lonely lives, peopled by vain regrets. At first he had tried to wring from the girl an explanation of her refusal to listen to a suggestion of their marriage, but finding that the subject caused her only unhappiness, he desisted. The Q.P. knew him no more during those days, and the change that was wrought in him by abstinence and healthful outdoor labor was little short of marvelous. He grew to take a keen pleasure in his physical fitness, and with a renewed health of body came a return of his formal mental efficiency. What the surgeons, tinkering with his hurt skull, have been unable to accomplish, nature did. Slowly, it is true, but nonetheless effectively. As his vigor of mind increased, his memory returned in part, so that he was constantly haunted by a growing conviction that somewhere, some place far from Goliath, he had known June Lanthrop, and that she had been intimately associated with that other life that was once again taking concrete form in his recollections. Not that he had ever entirely forgotten his past, for he had not. Rather, he recalled it as through a haze with confused and distorted details, so that he was never quite sure of the true identity of what he saw back there in the years that were gone. But after all else was plain, the figure of June Lanthrop of the past still remained little else than an intangible blur. There was something needed to recall her more distinctly than his unaided memory could do. Nor was that thing to be long wanting. The gold that Secor washed from the gravel of the old river bar was barely sufficient to meet his daily needs. As a result, his ranch— he always laughed as he referred to the bit of sagebrush desert as my ranch, was sold for taxes. The time was approaching when, if he would regain it, he must act. But having no money, he was forced to remain helpless as the time approached. One day while he was in Goliath, he mentioned the thing to June. Of course, the land is not worth the taxes, he said, but somehow I've grown attached to it. It's the only home I have. I shall hate to see it go, but I'll be as well off, I suppose. Not worth the taxes, she exclaimed. Why, Ogden Secor, where have you been for the last six months? Didn't you know the new government reclamation project is at last an assured fact, and that your land will jump from nothing an acre to something like a hundred dollars an acre overnight? Secor looked at her blankly. I didn't know it came as far down river as my holdings, he said. Why, your land is right in the center of it. There's every chance in the world a new town will be located there, and if that happens, you'll be wealthy. He smiled ruefully. Not I, he said, for I couldn't raise the money to redeem the ranch if my life depended on it. How much is necessary, she asked. He told her. The next day, Monday, she drew her savings from the bank and turned them over to Secor. At first, when she had suggested the thing, he had refused flatly. But after talking with several men who were well posted, he had seen that there was no question but that the land would increase in value immensely and that she would be able to repay June in the near future. 
The same day word came of the exact location of the proposed town. It brought definite information to the effect that a large portion of Secor's holdings would lie directly in the business center of the town, and the balance on the gentle rise back from the river that had been set apart for residential purposes. June and Ogden were so elated that they could scarcely contain themselves. Nothing would do but they must celebrate with a dinner at the Short Line Hotel, the most pretentious hostelry of Goliath. At first, June demurred, but Ogden was insistent, and so she asked for the afternoon and evening off. They strolled together beside the little stream where he had wrung from her lips an avowal of the love she had no right to harbor for Ogden Secor. Once again he revived the subject that had long been taboo, urging her to forget whatever to him unfathomable scruples kept her from him, but she only shook her head sadly, and when he saw how unhappily it made her, he tried to drop the subject, though he found it most difficult to drop. As they approached the hotel where they were to hold their modest celebration, the limited, a train from the east, lay along the platform, up and down which the passengers were strolling. To reach the dining room it was necessary to walk past a part of the long line of Pullmans, and as they did so Secor was suddenly confronted by a trim little man with outstretched hand. "'My dear Secor,' he exclaimed, "'what in the world are you doing here? We have all wondered what could have become of you.' And then, turning toward the open window of the drawing-room, he called out, "'Oh, Sophia, see whom I have discovered.' Sophia Wells' person looked from the window. She and the Reverend Mr. Person were on their bridal trip. She saw Ogden Secor, and beside him she saw another whom she recognized. Coldly she barely inclined her head, turning away from the window immediately. Then Mr. Person looked at Ogden Secor's companion for the first time. He, too, recognized her. "'My gracious!' he exclaimed. His eyes went wide in holy terror. "'My gracious! Excuse me, Secor, but the train is about to start.' And without a backward glance he hastened toward his car. The sight of Sophia Wells and the Reverend Mr. Person, and the glances of contempt they had shot towards June Lathrop, had done in an instant what months of vain attempt at recollection had failed to do. With the suddenness of an unexpected slap in the face, they returned to Ogden Secor the memory of the last time he had seen these three together. As clearly as if it had been but yesterday, he saw the figures about his bed as he lay propped up upon his pillows at St. Louis. He saw Sophia Wells and the Reverend Mr. Person. He saw Stickler, nervous and unstrung, and he saw Doherty, his heavy hand upon the arm of the girl from Farris's. Slowly a dull red crept across his face. He turned toward June. The look of misery in her eyes showed that she realized that memory had returned. "'Now you understand at last,' she said in a dull voice. He took her by the arm and led her into the dining room. She scarce realized what she was doing when she permitted herself to go with him. He found a table in the corner, seating himself across from her. "'The cad,' he said. "'The dirty, little, hypocritical cad!' She looked at him in astonishment. "'You mean?' she started. "'I mean person.' But he was right. He couldn't recognize me, she replied wearily. Then she rose from the table. I'll go now, she said. I don't know why I came in here. I must have been stunned. I knew that you would find out some day, but I didn't know it would be so dreadfully terrible. Her lips trembled. He reached across the table and forced her gently back into her chair. The only terrible thing about it, he said, is that there should be such people as the Reverend and Mrs. Person in the world. That and the fact that they have made you unhappy. You mean that you don't hate me, now that you remember, she asked? I have guessed for a long time, June, he replied, that there was something in your past life that you thought would make our marriage impossible if I knew of it. You have misjudged me. I do not care what you have been or what you have done. That is past. It can't be helped now or undone. All I know is that I love you, and now that I know all there is to be known, there can be no further reason why you should hesitate longer. The old smile lighted his face. Oh, June, he said, can you see that it is only our love that counts? If you can forget what I have been, if you can forget the saloon brawls, if you can forget the chain gang, what have you done that I might not forget? For you were but a young girl while I was a strong man. Nothing that you may have been can exceed in the ignominy depth of which I sunk. You do not remember all, then, she said sadly. You have forgotten what Doherty accused me of, giving the combination to the man who robbed the safe. I remember everything, he replied, but I do not believe it. No, I do not want you even to deny it, for that would imply that I could believe it. I am glad that you don't believe it, she said, for that, at least, was not true. But the rest is true about Ferris's. He could not help wincing at that, for he was still a Puritan at heart. Let's not speak of it, he said. It doesn't change my love for you. I am sorry that it had to be so, but it is. And we must make the best of it, just as we must make the best of the memory of what I became here in Goliath, the town drunkard. I want you, June, and now there is nothing more to keep you from me. Tell me, dear, that there is nothing more. She was about to reply when a broad-shouldered man arose from the table behind them. As he approached, June was the first to see his face. At sight of him she turned deathly pale. It was Doherty. He stepped to her side and laid his hand upon her shoulder. "'Well, Mag,' he said, "'I've had a devil of a time finding you, but I've got you at last.' Ogden Secor leapt to his feet. "'What does this mean?' he cried. "'Who are you?' 
What is it, June? What does he mean? Mr. Doherty did not recognize Mr. Ogden Secor, whom he had seen but once or twice, and then under different circumstances and in widely different apparel. It means, Bo, said Mr. Doherty, that your lady friend is under arrest for the murder of John Secor four years ago. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of The Girl from Farris's by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Chapter Fourteen Some Loose Threads. The case of the People versus June Lathrop, alias Maggie Lynch, came to trial in the old criminal court building. Since her arrest, June had persistently refused to see Ogden Secor, though he had repeatedly endeavored to have word with her. She felt that his desire to come to her was prompted solely by gratitude for her loyalty to him when their positions had been reversed, when he had been the prisoner. How the case had come to be revived, no one seemed able to explain. A scarehead morning newspaper had used it as an example of the immunity from punishment enjoyed by the powers of the underworld, showing how murder, even, might be perpetuated with perfect safety to the murderer. It hinted at police indifference, even at police complicity. No Secor millions longer influenced the placing of advertising contracts. The police in self-defense explained that they had never ceased to work upon the case, and that they were already in possession of sufficient evidence to convict. All they required was a little more time to locate the murderer, and then they got busy. It happened that Doherty knew more about the almost forgotten details of the affair than any officer in the force, so to Doherty was given the Herculean task of locating Maggie Lynch. Another officer was entrusted with the establishment of a motive for the crime and the investigation of the antecedents of Maggie Lynch. The results of the efforts of these two sagacious policemen were fully apparent as the trial progressed. At first it seemed that there would be neither lawyer nor witnesses for the defense, but at the eleventh hour both were forthcoming. Ogden Secor had seen to that, and there was presented the remarkable spectacle of a young man working tooth and nail in the building up of the defense of the woman charged with the murder of his uncle. All that he had knew at first was that she had been the inmate of the house where John Secor had dropped dead of heart disease. The state, to establish a motive, brought a slender, gray-haired woman from the little village fifty miles south of the metropolis. She was sprung as a surprise upon the defense and as she was called to the witness chair from the antechamber, June Lathrop half rose from her chair, her lips parting and her face dead white. The eyes of the little woman ran eagerly over the courtroom. When they rested at last upon the face of the defendant, tears welled up in them. With a faint cry in outstretched arms, she took a step towards June. "'My daughter,' she whispered. "'Oh, my daughter!' A bailiff laid his hand gently upon her arm and led her to the witness chair. Her story was a simple one, and simply told. She related the incident of the first meeting of John Smith and June Lathrop. Smith's automobile had stalled in front of the Lanthrop homestead, and while the chauffeur tinkered, the master had come to the door asking for a drink of water. He had seen June, and almost from that instant his infatuation for the girl had been evident. Afterward he came off into the little village where the daughter and her widowed mother lived. Finally he spoke of marriage. June had told her mother of it, and that she hesitated because of the great difference in their ages. She respected and admired John Smith, but she did not know that she loved him. He brought her beautiful presents, and there was promises of a life of luxury and ease something the girl had never known, for her father had died when she was a baby, and the mother had been able to eke out but a bare existence since. It had been the promise of ease and plenty for her mother's declining years that had finally influenced June to give a reluctant yes. They had been married quietly by a justice of the peace, and had been driven directly to town in Smith's machine. The former Secor chauffeur established the identity of Smith as John Secor. He distinctly recalled their first visit to the Lanthrop house, and almost weekly trips to the little town thereafter. He positively identified the defendant as the girl whom, with John Secor, he had driven from the Lathrop home to the city on the day of their wedding, at which he had been a witness. "'Where did you leave the couple after arriving here?' asked the state's attorney. "'At Abe Farris's place on Dearborn,' replied the witness. When June was called to the stand, she corroborated all that had gone before. It seemed that a motive had been established. "'Did you know the nature of the place to which Mr. Smith took you at the time?' asked the attorney. "'I did not. He told me that it was a family hotel.' and when, after we had been there for a few days, I remarked on the strange actions of the other guests, their late hours, ribald songs, and evidences of intoxication. He laughed at me, saying that I must get used to the ways of the big city. Did you believe him? Of course. I had never been away from my home in my life. I knew absolutely nothing about the existence even of such places as that, or of the forms of vice and sin that were openly flaunted there. I was so ignorant of such things that I believed him when he told me that the men who came nightly to the place were the husbands of the women there. We had a room on the second floor, and though I heard much that passed on the house, I saw very little out of the way, and we kept closely to our room when we were in the place. When did you discover that your husband already had a wife living, and that his name was John Secor, and not John Smith? About half an hour after he dropped dead in the hallway, she replied, Abe Farris came to me and told me. He offered me a hundred dollars to keep still and pretend that I had never seen or heard of Mr. Secor, 
I didn't take the money. I was heartbroken and sick with horror and terror and shame. I wouldn't have told any one of my disgrace under any circumstances. Farris kept me there for two days longer, telling me that the police would arrest me if I went out. Finally, I determined to leave, for at last I knew the whole truth of the sort of place I was in. Then Farris urged me to stay there and go to work for him. When I refused, he explained that I was already ruined, and he even laughed when I told him that I did not know that I was not legally married to Mr. Smith. You don't think for a minute that anyone will swallow that yarn, do you? he asked. If you want to keep out of jail, you'd better stay right here. You can never be no worse off than you are now. I began to feel that he was right, yet I insisted on leaving, and then he had my clothes taken away from me, saying that I owed him money for board that Mr. Secor had not paid, and that he would not let me go until I paid him. I think that I must have almost been mad from grief and terror. I know that at last I grew not to care what became of me, and when Farris made me think that I could escape arrest only by remaining with him, I gave up, for the thought that my mother would learn the awful truth were I to be brought to trial was more than I could bear. Farris testified that he had been the first to tell a girl that the man she thought her husband was the husband of another woman. When did he tell her this? asked the attorney for the defense. Half or three-quarters of an hour after Mr. Secor died. Afterwards, two reputable physicians testified that they had performed a post-mortem examination upon John Secor's body, that there had been no evidence of poison in the stomach, or bruises, abrasions, or wounds upon his body, and that there could be no doubt but that death had been a result of an attack of acute endocarditis. The jury was out about fifteen minutes, returning a verdict of not guilty on the first ballot. To June Lathrop it meant nothing. It was what she had expected, but though it freed her from an unjust charge, it would never right the hideous wrong that had been done to her, first by an individual in conceiving and perpetuating the wrong, and then by the community, as represented by the police, in dragging the whole hideous fabric of her shame before the world. As is customary upon the acquittal of a defendant in a criminal case, a horde of the morbidly curious thronged about June to offer their congratulations. She turned from them wearily, seeking her mother, but there was one who would not be denied, a tall, freckled youth who wormed his way to her side with uncanny stealthiness. It was Sammy, the one-time office boy of the corporation known as John Secor & Co. "'Miss Lathrop,' he whispered. "'Miss Lathrop, I've been trying to find you for years. I'm a regular detective now, but the best job I ever did I did for you, and nobody never knew nothing about it. Don't you remember me?' She shook hands with him, and he followed her from the courtroom. There was another who followed her, too, a suntanned young man whose haggard features bore clear witness to the mental suffering he had endured. Outside the building he touched her sleeve. She turned toward him. "'Do you loathe me?' he whispered. "'For what he did?' You know better than that, she answered, but now you see why it was that I could not marry you. Now you will thank me for not being weak and giving in. God knows how sorely I was tempted. There's nothing now to prevent, he said eagerly. She looked at him in surprise. You still want me, she cried. You can't mean it. It would be horrible. I shall always want you, June, he said doggedly, and some day I shall have you. But still she shook her head. It would be wicked, Ogden, she said with a little shudder, if you had been anyone else, anyone else in the world than your father. Secor looked at her in astonishment. My father, he exclaimed. Do you mean that you do not know? That John Secor was not my father. The girl's astonishment and incredulity were writ upon her face. Not your father? It was scarce a whisper. I was the foster son of John Secor's brother. When he died, I went to live with the John Secors, and after the death of their only son, I entered Mr. Secor's office, taking the place of the son he had lost, later inheriting his business. June continued to look in dull bewilderment at Secor. It could not be true. She cast about for another obstacle. Certainly she had no right to such happiness as she saw being surely pressed upon her. There is still the charge against me of having aided the men who robbed your safe. That is even worse, for it reproaches me with disloyalty and treachery toward one who had befriended me, she said faintly. Sammy and June's mother had been standing a little apart as the two spoke together in whispers. June had slightly raised her voice, and she recalled the affair in the office of John Secor & Co., the night that Ogden had received the blows that had resulted in all his financial troubles. That part Sammy heard. Now he stepped forward. That's what I wanted to tell you about, Miss Lathrop, he said excitedly. It wasn't her at all, he went on, turning toward Secor. It was that smooth scoundrel of a stickler. I was hiding under his filing cabinet when he tried to make Miss Lathrop go out with him, and I heard her turn him down. Then I followed him, for I was just studying to be a detective then, I had to practice every chance I got. He went straight to Abe Farris's saloon, and there I saw him talking low and confidential-like to a couple of tough-looking guys for about two hours. He handed one of them a slip of paper, explaining what was on it. I couldn't see it, but from what had happened after, I knew it held the combination to your safe, for I seen the robber that was shot when he was put on trial, and he was one of the guys that Stickler met in Farris's. I was so scared I didn't tell nobody. Ogden turned towards June with a faint smile. You see, he said, that one by one your defenses are reduced. Aren't you about ready to capitulate? I guess there's no other way, she sighed, but it seems that the world must be all awry when hope and happiness appear so close with my grasp. End of chapter 14 End of The Girl from Farris's by Edgar Rice Burroughs